Hello? Today I want to talk to you about learning how to learn. Um, most of us probably think we know how to learn, that we know the best ways in which to study. But I've discovered, and most of us in the field have discovered, that time and time again students tend to use the least effective study strategies. So I want to talk today about the most effective study strategies. What are the ways that you can maximize the return on your investment for studying? So what we're going to talk about today is, first of all, a little bit of how learning is misunderstood. And then we're going to talk about how one of the best ways to learn is to retrieve by testing yourself. We'll talk about mixing it up by um, studying in smaller chunks rather than all at once and doing so in different orders, that kind of thing. Uh, we'll talk about embracing desirable difficulties, avoiding illusions of knowing, talk about the myth of learning styles, and finish up with a little bit about some encoding strategies. A little bit of uh, full disclosure, some of the titles for my uh, sections came from a really terrific book I'll talk about at the end called Make It Stick uh, by uh, some leaders in the field, Mark McDaniel and uh, Roddy Rodiger. <coughs> so we'll start with talking about how learning is misunderstood. We often engage in the least effective memory, memory strategies because they feel like they work. It feels like we're getting something done. So we always like to feel like we're doing something. But unfortunately, when we feel like we're getting something done, when it comes to studying, oftentimes we are not. In fact, one of the most often cited strategies that students use is simple repetition. They look over the notes over and over again. They repeat things over and over to themselves. Uh, this kind of rote memorization has been sort of drilled into us as the best way to learn. Well, it's actually one of the worst ways to learn. That is, it's one of the least effective strategies. So and I want to demonstrate this to you um, by showing you a quick demonstration. This comes from a really terrific paper by Blake Nazarin and Castle on recall and recognition of the Apple logo. So if you're at home or wherever, set aside everything, make sure you're not looking at your computer or your phone, <laughs> and think about how confident are you that you'd be able to draw the Apple logo from memory. And then how about recognizing the correct logo? So again, without looking, hopefully you're not staring at an Apple logo right now, but is it this one? Perhaps it's that one. Could be this one. Could be this one. That one. This one. This one. Maybe that one. So these are those choices all lined up. Now, if you think about the number of times a day all of us look at an Apple logo, uh, it, it's pretty astounding. So we ought to perfectly easily be able to pick out the Apple logo. And of course, it's actually uh, option B. But you can probably convince yourself that it's almost any of these. And I use some other examples in my classes, like in which hand does the Statue of Liberty hold her torch? Uh, what's on the back of a $10 bill? Uh, these kinds of things. And if we knew them with great confidence, um, that would be one thing. But most of us don't. I mean, we kind of think we know, but we could probably talk ourselves into any of these. And if the things we see all the time and repetition is an effective strategy, then we shouldn't have any difficulty with this. Well, uh, Blake and colleagues discovered that only one out of 85 of their participants could correctly draw the Apple logo from memory. Only half of participants could correctly choose the logo from those options I showed you earlier. Participants were exceptionally confident in their ability before the test, and then much less so afterwards. That is, they really thought they knew what the Apple logo looked at like, but it turns out they didn't. So what's happening in here? Well, learning is a skill that requires effort and deliberative practice. And we don't tend to sit down and try to memorize the Apple logo. And it's the same thing with studying. Oftentimes we sit down and we use this kind of passive strategy, reading. You have to be engaged. You have to be deliberative. It's just like learning um, how to play the piano, learning uh, tennis skills. You wouldn't go out to a piano recital without having practiced beforehand. And that's what I always tell my students when it comes to exam time. You want to practice beforehand. You don't want to show up cold just having looked over the material. You know, unless you are some crazy whiz kid piano player, you wouldn't be able to look through the sheet music and then be able to play a piece perfectly prior to um, a piano concert. Of course not. You would want to practice the piece. It's the exact same thing uh, when it comes to study studying for exams. So at the end of the day, if you do it right, you can actually usually study less and actually learn more by being more efficient and engaging in better strategies. So the first thing we want to talk about is to learn to retrieve, is 
you need to retrieve. So we talk about retrieval practice and we talk about testing effects. So engaging in retrieval practice is actually an incredibly great way to learn material. So this is from a couple of studies by um, Burr and Paschler and Rodiger and Karpicki. Um, and basically what they showed in these studies is that if you're five minutes prior to taking a test, looking over your notes isn't a bad strategy. So if you look here, the darker bars are uh, participants who studied material, then studied them again, and then engaged in a test. The lighter bars here are participants who studied material, then were tested on it, and then were tested on it five minutes later. And you can see that five minutes later, studying again is pretty effective. But when we're talking about two days later, that test was far more effective. When we get out to a week, again, much more effective to have been tested. So we get much less forgetting when we've been tested compared to when we just simply have studied again. So when you're studying for exams, one of the best things to do is to test yourself and engage in that retrieval practice. What's happening here is you're actually reinforcing that memory. Uh, there is a great deal of neuroscience that shows us that there are reciprocal connections between where you would learn things and where you retrieve things. I'm going to oversimplify this. But essentially, every time you retrieve a memory, you create another memory, or you create a stronger memory, or reinforce that memory. And so you're constantly, every time you retrieve a memory, you're making that memory stronger. And so that's what's happening here, is you are actually creating a stronger memory by actually retrieving it. So at the end of the day, what we mean is that you need to test yourself and to understand that testing is not just a means of assessment. They're actually learning opportunities. Um, in fact, one of the things we've been able to sh see in the literature is that testing is actually a great way uh, to learn, not just to assess. Uh, this is based on a long-standing, incredibly robust finding which we call the generation effect. Uh, and the basic idea here is if you look at participants who generated items from themselves versus red items, they're much more likely to remember the generated items later. So for example, if I had you generate the word, first word that came to mind here, which is usually cold, so hot versus cold, versus reading car versus bus, you're more likely to remember cold later than you are to remember bus later. Again, a slight oversimplification of the generation effect, but in general, basically things that we internally generate uh, are much more likely to be remembered later. It's the same thing with testing. When you are retrieving something yourself, when you're generating it, the answer yourself, you're much more likely to remember it later. Uh, clearly, testing is superior to restudying. In a variety of, of studies, this has been shown, and it's been shown to work with a variety of different test types, so multiple choice tests, short answer and essay tests. Even open book and closed book show similar uh, benefits for long-term retention. And the reason why open book and closed book exams show similar uh, amounts of retention is if you think about how you answer an exam in these circumstances, in an open book exam, you don't read the question and look up the answer. You try to remember the answer first, right? You try to think if you know it first, and then you only look it up if you can't remember it later. Now, the closed book exam is probably better for your own studying for short-term retention. Um, but over the long term, both have benefits uh, for uh, retention of material. One of the important things to understand about testing effects is that feedback is important. Uh, the reason feedback is important, that is, checking whether or not your answers were correct, is you get increased retention of low confidence but correct responses. So you, we've all had that situation where we take an exam, we're not sure if we got the answer right or not, we don't have much confidence in that. Well, by getting that feedback, you know you were correct, and it increases the retention of that kind of low confidence, correct response. It also reduces later false memory for incorrect responses. So if you're simply studying uh, yourself, make sure you check to see whether you got the answers correct. So if you're taking practice exams, if you're using Quizlet, um, studying from quizzes your professor may have provided, uh, making sure you get that kind of feedback is really important. Uh, also, I think it's important from an instructor perspective that you provide feedback to your students. And also, if your professor doesn't give you your exams back, you go and get them and look at them and see which ones you got right and got wrong and make yourself some notes. I give my students back all their exams. Uh, they have a chance to look over uh, their responses. Uh, 
I do quizzing online, and as soon as the, all the students have taken the quiz, I set them for review so they can go through and review which ones I got right, which ones I got wrong, and they can use those to test themselves later. So it's a really great way for students to learn. Uh, spacing out testing uh, results in very dramatic improvements in retention. So if you can test yourself, quiz yourself a couple times a week, uh, you'll really get some dramatic benefits. Uh, my students take at least one quiz a week uh, in the regular semester, uh, and then I quiz them a little bit here and there throughout the class. Really effective uh, learning technique. One of the things we know is that students don't often test themselves when studying. Um, they rely instead on just reading their notes or highlighting. Highlighting is not studying, by the way. Highlighting is just coloring. It's perfectly fine if your goal is to be able to find something later. Um, that's what I use highlighting for when I'm reading journal articles, that sort of thing. I want to find a main point later. But it's not effective for retaining any information. What's happening here is students get what's called an illusion of comp competence. Uh, that is, when they read the material and then they read the material again, it seems like they know it. Because they just read it, it seems very familiar. And so they get this illusion that they've learned the material when, in fact, it's just familiar because they read it earlier. Uh, again, this most often reported study strategy is repeated reading of material. Not a very effective strategy. So testing yourself is a really great way to uh, learn more. Testing your students is a really great way to get them to learn more. Um, we're talking again about targeted, topical testing, not standardized testing. Two different things. So the next thing I want to talk about is called mixing it up. And the basic idea here is that you want to space out your practice or space out your studying will result in much greater learning. So the essential issue here is what we call spaced versus masked study. So if you think about it very simply, you could study for one hour, one day, or 15 minutes each day over four days. Same amount of time, but those 15 minutes per day over four days will be far more effective than that one hour on one day. So spacing out your studying over different time, different places, is a really important thing to do. We also call this interleave study. There are slightly different issues, but from a practical perspective, they often have the same import. And the basic idea is, rather than focusing all on one topic for an hour or two hours, is to interleave your study. So study you know, math for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then switch to psychology for 20 minutes, and then switch to Spanish for 20 minutes. So you're mixing it up, getting things in a little bit different order, creating different contexts. Uh, this is really one of the oldest and most robust findings in the literature. It goes all the way back to Hermann von Ebbinghaus in 1885. Um, this basic idea of spacing out how you're learning things is a particularly effective strategy. So to give you some examples from the literature that demonstrate this sort of spacing and interleaving effect, uh, studying artistic painting styles in an inductive learning paradigm, it's much more effective if you switch from one artist to the other and back, sort of mix them up a little bit, rather than studying a bunch of Monet's, a bunch of Manet's, a bunch of whoever else, uh, not an art person. So basic idea here is to switch back and forth a little bit. One of the things that happens when you study, say, all of one artist's paintings in a row, you're basically trying to learn that artist's style, when really the important thing to do is to learn the differences between styles. And so switching back and forth is really a much more effective way to go. It's also probably the way the exam is going to be read. Um, learning grammatical structure in English learning adults, again switching around material, uh, abstract mathematics, it's a common mistake in almost every math textbook. I think the last somebody told me there's one math book that doesn't do this, but almost all math books have the same structure. They have five problems of one type, another five problems of a different type, and then five problems of some other type. The problem with that is that you're doing the same thing over and over again, and so you're not learning the differences between those problem types. You apply the solution to the first problem, and you apply it to the second, third, fourth, and fifth, uh, and then you get to the sixth problem, oh, it's something different, and then, so it's much more effective to randomize the order of math problems. So if your math instructor is giving you homework like this, don't do it in order. I mean, do all the homework, don't get me wrong, but do problem number one, then problem number eight, and problem number three, and 
mix it up. Do it in a different order because you'll learn more that way. Um, same thing with identifying animal species. Rather than studying all one species, study different ones. Uh, this one I find really interesting. Common practice in learning musical pieces is to sit down and play, sing, uh, practice the same piece over and over again uh, in a row. And this is where we get into that illusion of confidence again. Because you have been engaging in playing the same piece, those motor plans, what we call them, uh, are primed and ready to go. And so it gets easier and easier each time. The problem is, is when you come back the next day or a week later, you haven't learned it as well as you thought you had. It creates this illusion of learning because you have been doing the same thing over and over again. In this uh, really in to interesting 2013 study, they found that if they mixed up the practice of piano mel melodies, so rather than playing the same piece for an hour and then playing a different piece for an hour, they played one piece, then they switched to a different piece, and then they switched to a different piece, and then they came back and they switched up again. Uh, and they actually were much more effective at learning. And so when you're trying to learn, say, an entire concert of music, it's much better to do one piece, then switch, and then practice that piece, and then switch, because it creates longer learning. It's tougher. It feels harder. It doesn't feel like you're learning it as well, but you actually are. And that's one of the important things to understand. So the problem with math study is you get this metacognitive illusion. This mass practice results in an illusion of competence. As mass practice continues, we use this ease of <laughs> acquisition heuristic to guide our learning because each time we do that, each time we play the same piece, it seems easier and easier. Each time we study the material, it seems easier and easier. Each time we do the same math problem, it seems easier and easier. And the problem is, is you're not actually learning. You're, they're just getting easier because you have just done them so recently. So it's not long-term learning that's occurring. It's just this illusion, this ease of acquisition illusion that's occurring. So unfortunately, this often results in little long-term retention. So why does the spacing effect work? Well, it's important to understand the relationship between episodic memory and knowledge. Episodic memory is linked to specific contexts such as time and place. So what did you have for breakfast this morning? What were you doing 30 minutes ago? What did you do yesterday? These are linked to times and places. Knowledge, which we often call our semantic memory, is independent of any learning context. So you might later today or tomorrow tell somebody what you learned from this particular talk, um, and you'll remember when and where you were when you learned it. You probably can't tell me when and where you were when you learned that George Washington was the first president of the United States, um, because that knowledge has become independent of its learning context. So episodic memory supports our early knowledge acquisition. That is, we remember its times and places. So when we space out our s learning, we result in multiple contexts. What was happening right before, what was happening right after, what mood we were in, whether it was hot or cold, was there noise, were we at the library or Starbucks. A lot of people are told they should have one place to study, that they should always study in that one place because that will matter study. You know, or a little, this is you should only study in this one place. That's actually a bad idea. Um, it's much more effective to um, study in multiple contexts. So wherever you're comfortable studying, if you need a quiet place, go to the library or put on some headphone noise-canceling headphones, um, uh, go outside, go to Starbucks, wherever you're comfortable, whatever works for you, I think is the most important thing. One of the most important, uh, other important things to think about is you want to embrace desirable difficulties. We call this the problem of desirable difficulties. Uh, learning that requires effort is generally superior. Um, it's similar to what's called the Yerkes-Dodson effect. So this is the relationship between sort of stress and performance. So our level of arousal, that is how stressed or, or motivated we are, is related to our performance. If we're not motivated enough, we're not going to perform very well. Um, lots of motivation we're going to perform very well. If we're too stressed, we're not going to perform well either. Similar to learning, there is this kind of sweet spot. Uh, because we want to have some effort, too easy, we're probably not learning anything, too high, and we're going to be frustrated. So we want to be not frustrated, but also not coasting along. This is where you're going to learn the most. Some of you may have had this experience where you got moved to an advanced class and started doing better. That's what happened when I was in um, middle school.
I got moved to advanced math and suddenly my grades went up. Because I was over here in this low, not challenged enough, but it wasn't so high that I was frustrated. I see this mistake a lot of times in statistics students. They focus on things that they just don't get. So they're like, I don't get this at all, so I have to focus all my effort on that. As a result, they never learn that incredibly difficult thing, and they also never learn all the stuff they could have gotten. Essentially, learning is just like anything else. You have to know where you are and push yourself a little bit. You're not going to walk into a gym for the first time and bench press 300 pounds. You're going to hurt yourself. Similarly, if you've never stretched a day in your life, you can't walk into a yoga class and put your foot behind your head. You're going to hurt yourself. It's the same thing with learning. You have to know where you are, and you want to figure out where you are, and then push yourself a little bit and get that, and then push yourself a little bit. So something like statistics, you have to get the base material and then start pushing yourself, pushing yourself a little bit more, a little bit more, so you start to get the material down. You may never get the most difficult material, but you also then will have all the other stuff that you might have not gotten had you focused all your effort on this, the most difficult pro problem. And so it's a really important thing to understand. You have to be challenged, but not frustrated. And so it's a delicate balance, but you have to sort of get into that zone. So trying to get into that zone is what we call the region of proximal learning. So again, understanding what you already know and understand is critical. And then push yourself a little bit further, learn a little bit more, push yourself a little bit further. And we do this all the time, I think, without thinking of it in this way. Um, if you're learning something new like cooking, you're probably not going to tackle the most difficult thing first. Um, so you probably, if you let's say you're learning how to bake, you're probably not going to start with learning how to bake croissants or make pretzels or something, bagels, things that require a little bit of extra effort. You'll start somewhere simpler. Cake, cookies, biscuits, you know, and then move on from there. Um, so there are things that are incredibly difficult. I have never figured out how to make a good hollandaise sauce. It's on my list of things to try to figure out how to do. Uh, but understanding where your skill set is and trying to push yourself a little is what you want to do. So build on what you know and focus on what's just beyond your current skill level and then move on because you'll get that. Same thing with the gym. You, so you start with 45 pounds on each side of a bench press bar and then, you know, next week you might be able to add, add 10 pounds and then, you know, within a couple months you might have two plates. So you might have 90 pounds on each side of the bar. That's how learning works. You have to build those muscles. So the next thing I want to talk about is avoiding illusions of knowing. So this is an introduction to metacognition and metamemory. And you're probably wondering what Donald Rumsfeld has to do with any of this. Well, Donald Rumsfeld has the best quote about metamemory that's not about metamemory. And here's the quote. There are knowns. These are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say there are things that we know that we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we don't know that we don't know. And I think right there is the most important part of, of Rumsfeld's quote. There are things we don't know that we don't know. And that's important. We have to know what we know, and we have to know what we don't know. Lao Tzu had a little bit more succinct. The wise man is one who knows what he does not know. So knowing what you don't know and knowing what you do know is an important part of learning. So we call this metacognition and metamemory. So this is knowledge and awareness of our own cognitive processes or our own memory. This is critical to understanding learning. How do we know what we've actually learned versus what we think we have learned? So one of the things we do in the literature is we try to get people to predict their later memory performance. That is, tell me how well you're going to remember this later. In general, we all stink at this. We often fall prey to what we call metacognitive illusions. So I want to show you first um, some work from um, Matt Rhodes and Alan Castle on perceptual fluency effects. It's a really great paper that shows essentially how this works. So we'll take the first pair of words, bird and dog. Participants are more likely to say, or likely to say they will remember the word bird better than the word dog, because it's bigger, it's easier to read. When we get down to this pair, horse versus canary, participants say they're likely to remember canary better because it's easier to read. Now here's the irony. There's really no difference in memory for bird versus dog up here, because they're really, there's not much difference. One's just bigger than the other, and so this one seems like I should remember it better. 
Uh, it's much different down here. You're actually much more likely to remember the word horse versus canary because this required some effort. This wasn't easy to read. This gets back at that desirable difficulty idea. So in the literature, we call this judgment of learning. So again, we're predicting memory performance later. Uh, and judging how well we learn later, we're bad at that. We get these perceptual fluency effects. Uh, Shanna Carpenter and her colleagues, uh, colleagues have demonstrated uh, an instructor fluency effect. That is, instructors that are very fluent, very easy to understand. Uh, we often think we're going, we overestimate our ability to remember them later because they just seem like they're easier to understand and remember. Um, now, we wouldn't, she, she would never argue, and I would certainly never argue, that instructors shouldn't be fluent. That is, they shouldn't be clear and concise. But for students, oftentimes, because they feel like they're learning in class, they often, then later, don't remember as much. So the problem, again, is we feel like we have learned because the material seems easier. And that's an important thing to understand. So how do we improve our meta memory? Well, one of the best things to do is test ourselves by evaluating your learning by trying to remember. So using self-testing to evaluate your memory is a terrific strategy because then what that tells you is what you have learned already versus what you still need to focus on. And then you can focus your effort on what you haven't learned yet rather than focusing on stuff you've already learned. And so again, we're talking about being more efficient and focusing your resources uh, where they can best be put to use. And so depending on the kind of class you have, you can come up with your own kind of multiple choice questions. Or if it's a ton of material, you could do what I used to do, sit down with a blank piece of paper, well, blank notepad, and try to write your entire notes or outline of your notes from memory. And then you go back and see, what did I miss? What did I forget? What do I still need to remember? And then you can go from there. So it's a really great way to diagnose your memory. And also, again, you're testing yourself, so it's a good study strategy. So before we finish up and talk about uh, different encoding strategies, I want to dispel one of uh, the great education myths of all time, and this is the myth of learning styles. There is no empirical evidence to support the idea of different learning styles. There may be different learning preferences. That is, some people may prefer one study style over the other, but these preferences are not tied to any improvements in learning. And in fact, as seen from the meta-memory literature, they may actually be worse for learning. That is, those things that feel like they work, we've shown and we've seen that they actually may be worse for learning. And so they may actually be setting themselves up for failure by trying to use some sort of learning style. So don't focus on learning style. Focus on results. And that's what's really important. So I want to finish up with some encoding strategies. And I'm just going to talk about these in general. Um, the first thing are what we call mnemonic techniques, and there are a bunch of different kinds of mnemonic techniques. People use acronyms or peg word mnemonics, so things like Roy G. Biv for red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Um, med students learn a bunch of these mnemonic techniques to try to remember the cranial nerves and all sorts of other things. Uh, these are pretty good. Uh, there are other mnemonic techniques like um, the method of loci where you tie um, things to be remembered to specific locations. If you've heard of this idea of memory palaces, that's what these are. If they're effective for you, they're, they're good for that. Um, far more useful for most of us are things like elaboration. Elaboration is just simply embellishing on the material uh, by focusing on it and working memory, working with the material. So uh, I encourage students to do things like come up with their own examples of how they might explain a phenomenon, come up with their own definitions, think about how they might teach it to somebody else, um, think about how it might relate to their own life, what we call the self-reference effect. Uh, all really good techniques for uh, learning material. Organization is another great technique. Now, I'm not talking about just knowing where your books are, although that's important too. I'm talking about organizing material. Uh, and generally, we're talking about organizing it into things like an outline. I teach from an outline, as you might have noticed. Um, and that's because it's a great way to organize material. I encourage my students to take notes into the outline. When they're reading material, add them into the outline. It provides an organizational structure. Uh, anyone who's thinking about law school, 
you're going to spend a lot of time on outlines. You'll swap outlines, trade outlines, buy outlines, steal outlines. You'll do all sorts of outlining because we're talking about organizing things like an entire academic year's worth of material for one final exam. Um, so when I went to law school, we had midterm exams in December, um, but about 80% of our property law grade was from that one final exam in May that was cumulative from September. It's a ton of information to try to remember, uh, and so coming up with an organizational tool for that is really important. Uh, generation effects are the last thing. Um, again, generating your own examples, generating your own um, ideas, generating your own test questions, all these are really good study strategies. At the end of the day, it's about being active and engaged. Uh, those are the most important things for learning material. Passive learning simply does not work. So if you're interested in learning more about this, these are some great uh, places to look. Uh, Mark and Roddy's book, um, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning is really terrific. I promise I don't get any money for, for um, saying that. Um, some great papers, this um, paper down here by Jeff Karpicki and Henry Rodiger, Test Enhanced Learning, uh, terrific. Again, uh, Perspective in Psych Science is another good source for this. Uh, so take a look at that. Uh, These are really terrific uh, resources for trying to learn more about this topic. Thanks.